In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion on axial and equatorial positions found on cyclohexane. Now, let's begin by looking at the following cyclohexane. 1 isopropyl 2 methyl cyclohexane. That simply means that on our 6 carbon ring, on the first position, we're going to have our um, isopropyl. On the second position, we're going to have our methyl group. Now, recall that at room temperature, our cyclohexane interconverts from one conformation to a second conformation, from one chair conformation to a second chair conformation. Now, when the interconversion takes place, all the equatorial atoms become the axial atoms, and all the axial atoms become the equatorial atoms. Now, which one of these chair conformations is more stable? Is it this compound A, conformation A, or conformation B? Now, in conformation A, we have the axial position is filled with the isopropyl, while the uh, equatorial position is filled with the methyl. Now, when the interconversion takes place, now we have our isopropyl fills the equatorial position and the methyl group fills the exile position. So to figure out which one of these conformations, chair conformations, is more stable, we have to look at the Newman projection. So let's look at the Newman projection for compound A. In this human projection, in this conformational isomer, the larger isopropyl group is very close to the ring structure, seen here. This destabilizes the compound. Why? Well, because there is a bumping effect, steric hindrance, between this large or relatively large isopropyl group and the ring structure. Now, let's examine this conformation. So, this chair conformation, or in this conformational isomer, the smaller methyl group is next to the ring structure, while the larger isopropyl group is farther away. And this is relatively stabilizing. That means this relatively smaller group will not bump as much with our ring structure as this larger isopropyl group does. Now, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is this B structure, B, uh, the B chair conformation, is more stable, it's lower in energy than this compound A, than this chair conformation. Now, I want to ask the following question. How many stereoisomers exist for one isopropyl 2 methyl cyclohexane? So to figure out how many stereoisomers exist, we have to determine how many chiral carbons or stereogenic carbons exist. And then we have to use the following formula, 2 to the power n, where n is the number of chiral or stereogenic carbons. Now, let's count how many of these carbons we have. So we have the first carbon, and the second carbon. So that means we have two stereogenic carbons. So if n is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4. So we have four stereoisomers of compound A. Now, let's determine all of these stereoisomers. So here we have compound A, and compound A interconverts to the following chair conformation at room temperature. And in fact, Compound B predominates because it's stabilized by this conformation. So B predominates, it's more stable, it's lower in energy. So there's one stereoisomer and the second, and the second stereoisomer. In fact, compound A and B are known as dystereomers because they're not enantiomers. Now we're also going to have enantiomers for each of these compounds, for A and for B. So let's suppose we have our mirror, and let's take the mirror image of A and produce C, and take the mirror image of B and produce D. Now A and C are enantiomers, B and D are enantiomers, while A and B and C and D are dystereomers. So here we have 
four of our stereo isomers. So once again, to conclude, whenever you're trying to determine the number of stereo isomers in a compound, the first step you have to follow is to find the number of stereogenic carbons, of chiral carbons. And then to find the maximum number of stereoisomers, you simply use the formula 2 to the n, where n is the number of stereogenic carbons.